भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नरम च वनोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथोजय मुदीरयत नास्ता प्रयशो भद्रेशो नित्यम भागवत सेवय भागवती उत्तम श्लोके भक्ति भागवती नैस्तके सो रीडिंग फ्रॉम द श्रीमद् भागवतम द फिफ्थ कैंटो चैप्टर 14 द फॉरेस्ट ऑफ एन्जॉयमेंट टेक्स्ट नंबर 25 एंड आई एम गोइंग टू जस्ट रीड इट एज माय टू प्रेडेसेसर्स हैव डन Uh, instead of having everyone respond, and then we'll respond to the word for word. Kvachchitchasita vatadhyaneka di daivika bhotika miyanam darshanam pratini varane kalpo duranta chintaya vishana aste Crutch, crutch it, sometimes. Cha, also. Shita vata adi, such as cold and strong wind. Anika, various. Adi daivi dvika, created by the demigods. Bhotika adi bhotika, created by other living beings. Atmi anam adyatmika, created by the body and mind. Dashanam of conditions of misery. Pratinirvarane, in the counteracting, Alkalpa, unable, Doranta, very severe, Chintaya, by anxieties, Vishana, morose, Aste, he remains. Translation, being unable to protect himself from the threefold miseries of material existence, the conditioned soul becomes very morose and lives a life of lamentation. These threefold miseries are miseries suffered by mental calamities at the hands of the demigods, such as freezing wind and scorching heat, miseries offered by other living entities, and miseries arising from the mind and body themselves. So that's the translation of Srila Prabhupada's purport. The so-called happy materialistic person is constantly having to endure the threefold miseries of life called Adidaivika, Adiyatmika, and Adibhotika. Actually, no one can counteract these threefold miseries. All three may assail one at a time, or one misery may be absent and the other present. Thus the living entity is full of anxiety, fearing misery from one side or the other. The conditioned soul must be disturbed by at least one of these three miseries. There is no escape. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Ganajana Shalakaya Chakshu Militam Jena Taj Mai Shri Gaurave Namaha. So this verse uh, is about miseries. I'm sure everyone has had experience. Every, anyone in this material world, we have to suffer the threefold miseries. Interesting how at every moment the conditioned soul is suffering at least one of these threefold miseries. You can't, you can't have even a moment without this suffering. Uh, I remember before I knew about Krishna consciousness, 
I really wanted to enjoy and I did not want to suffer and I was understanding how there was always some suffering and I did not like that so I tried my very best to not have any suffering at different times. One time I, I spent a year hitchhiking, I don't know if you know what that is, just not paying for rides and have people pick you up and you drive all over the country. And I drove all over, had rides all over America for about a year, living in mountains, trying to understand the purpose of life. And there was a song, one song that, uh, don't think twice, it's all right. And I just thought that was like my philosophy, you don't think about it, it's okay. Anyway, we stopped, I had a ride from some people and we stopped in this beautiful field. It was beautiful trees all around and beautiful grass. It was like perfect. And I just wanted to enjoy that field. And I just ran out. We stopped, the, we had stopped the van there. I ran out into the field and I'm running and I'm running and trying to enjoy this. And then I turn around and there is uh, one of the ladies or girls in the car. She picks up my sandals and holds my sandals and I nodded, yes. I didn't know that in Florida, the grass has all these pricky things sticking up. So as I'm running to enjoy, I have all these things in my feet. And, and then when she brings my sandals out to me, I just start picking these things out of my feet. And then I put on that sandal, then I go to the other foot. So that was one time that I really tried to enjoy without thinking twice, just got into enjoying, and I could not enjoy. Uh, another time, the same, within the same year, I spent this year just trying to understand what the purpose of life was. I, I just, I, you know, I gave up everything and I, I tried doing some yoga, some meditating, I didn't know what I was trying differently. I tried fasting. I fasted for a week, not eating anything, just drinking water, just trying to understand. And actually Krishna, I didn't know he was Krishna at the time, but he was helping me very much to come to Krishna consciousness during this year. But another time I'm sitting by a, I met a bunch of people, I don't know any of these people, and we're having you know, good time sitting around the fire at night. And there was a big log in the fire going across the fire. And then somebody's chopping it, trying to break it in half to put the whole thing in. <clears throat> and while I'm sitting there, I'm realizing I'm feeling this pain in my body. And I shouldn't be feeling any pain. I should be completely free from all pain and completely uh, peaceful. So I just, relieve myself of this pain. And at that instant, a person who was chopping the log, hit the log, the log broke, came up and hit me in the head. <laughs> and that was my second time I realized I can't enjoy in this material world. And uh, another time was when I started to get into Krishna consciousness. I learned about Krishna and I really knew that I had to surrender to Krishna, but I didn't want to do it because this is in 1970, 1971. Anybody looking like this at that time was considered nuts. My family would never understand. I remember thinking I didn't want to wear a dress. You know, I considered this as a dress. And I, you know, I was this, you know, I just, that just like didn't go very well, it didn't sit very well with me. So I was riding on the back of my friend's motorcycle and in, in, in America there's, there's, there's traffic rules that people follow. <laughs> and they have stop signs and people stop. And I don't even know if they have stop signs in India. Not that it would matter if they had. Uh, but I'm riding on the back of my friend's motorcycle and I'm thinking, rather than becoming a devotee. See, I, I also saw that material life, there was no happiness. I felt it was dull. There was nothing that excited me in material sense gratification. It was just all dull. It just didn't bring anything to me. 
So when I was sitting on the back of my friend's motorcycle, I thought maybe if I got a motorcycle and lived dangerously, then I would get some happiness, thinking that you know if it's exciting, maybe there'll be some happiness in this world. So when I thought about this, now I see it was Krishna who in my head told me, well, if you're going to get a motorcycle, why don't you enjoy it? You know, how, you're not enjoying this ride. So I looked at myself and I'm holding on really tight to this motorcycle. So then I decided one more time, not to let go, but to just relax and enjoy the ride. And as soon as I did that, we're going in a car past a stop sign and we smashed right into the car. And at that time I said, I don't want to live dangerously. <laughs> and Krishna got that thought out of my mind. <clears throat> but the point is that no one can enjoy material life. Uh, no one except for devotees. Then when I actually became a devotee and I remember in a kirtan, I felt such bliss and no pain. I felt completely satisfied and no, nothing fell on top of me. I was like really new. It was confirmation that this was the right thing. So only for the devotee of the Lord, the, the liberated devotee, and Prabhupada says all my disciples are liberated. You know, we're, we're liberated because we're following the process. If you're following the process, it's like you're in the shower. If you're taking a shower and you're, you're considered clean. Now, if you get out of the shower before you finish soaping up and cleaning yourself, you might still be dirty, but you're considered clean because you're in the shower. Similarly, if you're in this Krishna consciousness process, you're considered pure. If you stick with it, you will be pure. There's no doubt about it. You just have to be determined to stick with this Krishna consciousness. Uh, so, the, the, the process of Krishna consciousness is, it's very simple and anyone who follows it will get purified and get free from these miseries. I was reading a little bit about different miseries and it says that we actually have to have knowledge. If you have knowledge, then you can become free from miseries. <clears throat> and Prabhupada is saying how people going to school, people are going to college. He said the reason they're going to college and they're taking engineering and they're taking uh, chemistry and philosophy and psychology and taking all these different courses is just to become free from miseries. That's their whole point. They can't succeed, but they think that they can. They, they, so they realize that knowledge, by knowledge I can become free from these miseries, but they're not getting any real knowledge. And if, Prabhupada said, if <clears throat> there were no, that we did not have these threefold miseries, nobody would go to school. <laughs> Why would you go? That's the whole point. You want to be happy. And you can't be happy when you're suffering. So I'm thinking, if I get money, then I can counteract these threefold miseries. So how do I counteract them? So if it's cold outside, I have a warm house, I have a heater, therefore I'm not suffering from these miseries. I'm still suffering from some of the other miseries, but not that, oh, if it's really hot, now I can put in an air conditioner. If I have money, I can do these things. I can have, a, I can somehow try superficially to counteract these threefold miseries, but the miseries are still there. I might not be suffering from the, from the heat or from the cold at that moment, but I go outside, I have to suffer again, or I'm suffering from some other miseries. You cannot get free from these threefold miseries with mundane knowledge. You can be the richest person in the world and you're still suffering so much. Why would someone has all, a lot of money and then they commit suicide. They don't do it because they're happy. They do it because they're suffering. Maybe they're suffering mental uh, disturbances. Prabhupada talks about mental disturbances. Sometimes I might suffer because somebody says something about me and therefore I'm suffering in my mind. 
They say something and that, oh, I feel really bad and now I'm, I'm suffering. So, I mean, this is, may sound very foolish, but we are suffering so many different ways. We're suffering from the mind, the body, and, and, and if you think about, we, we talk about how to become free from birth disease, old age, and that. These are miseries. Those are also included in these threefold miseries. Birth is suffering from, from your, your mother. You're getting, going through your mother's womb. It's so painful. Uh, your body, there's then disease, of course, everyone suffers. That's a, you're, you're a physical thing. Nobody wants to be diseased. Everyone has to be diseased. No one goes to life without getting diseased. They spend billions, trillions of dollars to become free from disease. No one is going to the drugstore and asking for some, a bottle of smallpox or a bottle of diphtheria or some, some typhoid. No one goes to the store, no one's trying to get these things, but automatically they get them. So everyone has to get disease, birth disease, old age. Old age, I remember giving a class in Hartford and there was some new person, <clears throat> some Westerner, <clears throat> and I was saying how old age is a lot of suffering in old age. She said, well, my grandmother's old and she's very, very happy. I, you, don't, you have no idea what your grandmother is experiencing. You know, old age, you have a lot more pain than you did when you were younger. You, you know, you can't, you can't move the way you thought you could move. You can't, you, you got back pains. And then you may think, you know, you, you don't, when you're old, you don't really think, oh, now I'm old, I'm feeble. You still think young, you still think the same way, just that you don't have the body to do anything with. It's almost like a ghost. A ghost has desires but can't fulfill the desires. You know, you have old age, it's, it's, it's almost similar. You would like to do these things. I remember Srila Prabhupada saying, he would like to, he remembers, he used to jump up, you know, up in the air really high. And now he thinks about it, but he can't do it. You know, old age is not very pleasant. Anyone who's old can tell you that. My mother is still alive. She's 92 years old and she's, I mean, she's suffering physically, but mentally, she said, just wait till you get old, you forget everything. You forget everything. And she forgets almost everything. And I told her one time, I told her, you know, because she forgets everything, I said, I, I figured I'd try this. I said, remember when we went, to, when I took you to Europe and visited the Eiffel Tower? And she said, oh, that I remember. <laughs> but she was joking, she knew we didn't go, you know, so. So she was joking that, anyway, it's a sarcastic thing. Maybe India is not ready for that yet. <laughs> but, but you forget everything. You forget so many things. So it's not pleasant. Old age is not pleasant. And death. Death is so painful, you can't even stay in your body anymore. Death is, no one wants to die. But of course, the death for the devotee, it's like, Prabhupada gave the example of a cat having a rat in its mouth. The rat is crying, you know, death, it's horrible. And the cat has a kitten in its mouth, and the kitten is, is so happy to be carried by its mother. So death is not the same for devotees. And it, and, and it says, Prabhupada says, how do you become free from these threefold miseries? He says, all you have to do is change your consciousness to Krishna consciousness. And then you don't suffer these threefold miseries. Now, we're seeing devotees still suffering. First of all, how many devotees are fully Krishna conscious, you know? So to the degree in which we are Krishna conscious, to that degree, we're not suffering so much. We're not affected by these things. An example is like someone who does some handiwork or even in the kitchen, you're cutting some vegetables or you're doing some work, you're doing some carpentry, you're cutting a piece of wood, whatever you might be doing. And in the process of your work, you get cut. And you're working, you're absorbed so much in this work, you don't even notice you got cut until you see blood all over. So you didn't feel the cut. You, didn't, you, were, you were not conscious of it at all. You were conscious of just what you were doing. So if you, if you can be Krishna conscious, absorbed in Krishna, then these pains of this 
uh, and, you know, of this material world are not going to affect you. You actually become transcendental to them. Uh, <clears throat> and another way you can look at it is even for those who aren't pure devotees. If we follow this process, then at the end of this life, if we're following this process for our whole life, or <clears throat> at least from when we start, it says in the beginning we have to follow all these things. The beginning is when you come to Krishna consciousness. So if you, from that point on, for the rest of your life, you know, chant all your rounds, follow the regulated principles, go to the temple, do service, support the temple, etc. Then, at the end of your life, you go back to Godhead. And when you go back to Godhead, then you're finished with these threefold miseries. So even if temporarily we may still be suffering these threefold miseries, it is going to end. One devotee was not very happy, and Srila Prabhupada <coughs> talked to him. <clears throat> that you don't, you know, you don't seem very happy in Krishna consciousness, you know. And he said, I'm, I am not very happy. And Prabhupada says, then why do you do, why are you continuing with this Krishna consciousness if you're not very happy? And he said, because I know in the future I will be happy. And Prabhupada said, that is very intelligent. So even if we're not so happy now in our Krishna consciousness, even if we're still suffering these threefold miseries, we should have no doubt that this is the only solution to get free from these threefold miseries. <clears throat> it's the material world. Prabhupada says we have to make the best use of a bad bargain. We made a bad bargain. We wound up here in this material world. Now make the best use of it, use it for Krishna. He said we've given millions of lives serving maya faithfully and what do we get all we get is the same uh threefold miseries if he says just give one life to krishna you just give one life to krishna then you can end all of this actually here in vrindavan because i also do some magic so i'm interested in these kind of things but Prabhupada, there was a magician who came and was doing some magic for srila Prabhupada, and <clears throat> some of the devotees were thinking he's a little too familiar with Prabhupada, like, you know, making coins come out of Prabhupada's ears, but Prabhupada seemed very amused. And then finally Prabhupada stopped him and said, can you, can you uh, get rid of birth, disease, old age, and death? And the magician said, no, I cannot do that. And he said, I'm a better magician than you. Because he, because Srila Prabhupada can get rid of birth, disease, old age, and death. That's the real magic. So, we, we have to just, just have faith, and the faith isn't blind. <clears throat> blind faith is, I really have no experience at all, I'm just following it blindly. No, in Krishna consciousness, everyone who follows Krishna consciousness gets some reciprocation from Krishna, some confirmation from Krishna that this is the right thing. I'm experiencing. So we have, it's not blind, so we have to keep our faith. <clears throat> There's going to be ups and downs. You know, sometimes you're going to be really happy in Krishna consciousness, sometimes you're not going to be very, very happy. Actually, Sudam, there was a devotee named Sudam, and he was Prabhupada's servant for a little while. <clears throat> and uh, he read, where, where Prabhupada says, the best gravity is the best way to control your mind by being grave is the best way to control your, your mind. So he's serving Srila Prabhupada and he decides he wants to control his mind. We all have our minds pretty much out of control. At least part of the time or most of the time, our minds are just going on all kinds of nonsense. If our mind was a, was a, a living entity coming in, we wouldn't let him into the temple. It's like our mind is so bad. So he wanted to control his mind, so he decided he's going to be grave. And he's serving Prabhupada. And, and Prabhupada, after a short time, told Sudam, Sudam, why are you so morose? <laughs> so there's a difference between gravity and being morose. <laughs> So don't try to artificially become grave just by being so serious about everything all the time. Uh, 
Of course, we are serious, but Prabhupada would also have has a sense of humor too. So in the material world, we have to get out. We have these threefold miseries. Actually, there's another verse I wanted to read from the previous chapter, the 13th chapter, verse 11. I'm just going to read the English, which is very similar to this verse that I just read. That I'm, Sometimes the living entity is busy counteracting the natural disturbances of freezing cold, scorching heat, strong wind, excessive rainfall, and so forth. When he is unable to do so, he becomes very unhappy. Sometimes he is cheated in business transactions, one after another. In this way, by cheating, living entities create enmity among themselves. So <clears throat> here's also, we try to counteract these things. This is what we're doing by going to college, getting a degree. We try to counteract these threefold miseries, but we can't succeed at it. And then you become morose, you become unhappy by these things. Uh, Prabhupada said uh, also, well in the Vedanta Sutra, it states, Atato Brahma Jignasa. Now in the human form of life, is a time to inquire about the absolute truth. Prabhupada says the beginning of human life is who am I? Why am I here? Why am I suffering? Humans understand that they are suffering. Animals do not understand they are suffering. Uh, Prabhupada gave an example of, of uh, a goat. He said he saw this himself. <coughs> the they were sacrificing, no, they, they, they were going to eat a goat. They wanted to eat goat, but they do it in a ritualistic way. And then they, you know, they cut the goat's throat, I assume, but they kill the goat with, with a knife. And uh, there's another goat right there waiting to get killed, and he's just eating the grass. So they have no idea of suffering. If it was a human being, now I think I got to try to avoid this. I got to do what I can to get out of here. I got to run. I got to do something. But an animal does not think that way. An animal thinks everything is fine. He is an animal. He doesn't know he's suffering and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. <clears throat> so humans, an intelligent human, understands he's suffering and he also understands I don't want to suffer. Why do I have to suffer? This is the beginning of human life. Unless you inquire about these things, you're considered an animal. And there are many people who go through their whole life and never ask these questions. They just assume this is life, just like an animal. Doesn't assume, doesn't know it's suffering, or may be cold and knows that, but doesn't, doesn't understand why I'm suffering. What is the reason I'm suffering? I don't want to be suffering but I have to suffer. And, and, and Prabhupada also said, we have to have a pessimistic view of material life. If we don't have a pessimistic view of material life, there would, there's no impetus for spiritual life. If everything was here, just like I said, if there was no suffering, no one would go to college. If there was no suffering, how many people would become devotees? You know, why would I bother with Krishna consciousness? I'm, everything is nice. So this suffering is there for a reason. It's to teach us this is, not a, this is not a very nice place. This is not our normal atmosphere. Our normal atmosphere is in the spiritual world. We're spiritual. We're spiritual in a foreign atmosphere. And no matter what you do, you cannot be happy until you're put back into your natural atmosphere. Just like a fish out of water. You take a fish, Put them, take them out of water, you give them pearls, you give them rupees, you give them diamonds, you give them some food, you give them a nice bed, even a water bed. I don't know if you know what water beds are, but uh, it's just a piece of plastic mattress filled with water so it just goes all over the place. You put them on top of that. You give them anything, give them a cigar. The fish is not going to be happy, but you put the fish back into water and then finally, providing you put him back soon enough, he'll be, he'll be happy in his natural atmosphere. <clears throat> so as a spirit soul, we can't be happy in this foreign place. It's not a very nice place. This is the material world. 
Abraham abu vanalo ka puna avati no juna mamu peite to count the puna janma na vinyate. From the highest planet in the material world down to the lowest, all the places of misery wherein repeated birth and death take place, certified by Krishna as a miserable place. I also, given class in Hartford, had a Indian Brahmin who was with some family member. And I mentioned this, how, how it's a miserable place. And he say, no, it's not. It's nice. He's trying to say how the material world is nice. I said, it's certified by Krishna as being miserable. And you're saying it's, it's not. You know, you're arguing with Krishna. It's like ridiculous. You have to be really foolish to think this is a nice place. Uh, it, it, even, if you, even if it is nice, it's only nice for a little bit. It's going to end. Just like you're going to be, well, I don't know if they do this here, but in, in America, if someone's going, they, they get the death sentence. They did some crime and now they have to be killed. They gave their last meal. Lots of times they have, they have a choice what they want to eat for their last meal. They're going to eat. Now, okay, I want this, I want that, I want... Nobody can enjoy that meal. You know you're going to die in a few minutes. You're going to get electrocuted or a gas chamber or some injections of poison. How are you going to enjoy that meal? Only a fool or an animal might be able to enjoy that meal because he can't understand what's going to happen the next minute. So similarly, if you can enjoy this world, it's only because of your forgetfulness of what's going to happen next. There's no enjoyment in this world. I had, go back to my hitchhiking experiences that brought me to Krishna consciousness to some extent. Uh, one time, there's a place called Big Sur. Anybody here from California or heard of Big Sur? Okay, <laughs> anyway, I wound up in Big Sur hitchhiking and I met about 40 different people and we're all in this big tent and it was at, late at night and we're having such a great time and then we find out that none of these people knew each other. It's like these two people knew each other, these two, and it's like we all met and it was so wonderful. And one person in the tent said, too bad, too bad in the morning, it's all going to be over. And I remember thinking, what a bummer, what a fool this guy is, you know. Everybody's consciousness went totally down. Soon, he was the only intelligent person in the whole tent who realized it's temporary. And once we knew it was temporary, we couldn't enjoy to the same extent. So the only reason you can even enjoy anything is because you think it's eternal. You think it's going to last. But if you understand, and you should understand, that it's going to end, you cannot enjoy it. I'm gonna, in, okay, you can enjoy for five minutes. Okay, great. And then what? Then you're gonna suffer. How can I enjoy knowing that? So you forget that you're gonna suffer. Maya, it's Maya's trick. She makes you think you're gonna enjoy and it's not going to end. And there's no one's enjoyment that doesn't end. Material enjoyment, uh, it has a beginning and it has an end. You know, Karpanya uh, Dosa Bihat, is that the first? Karpanya dosu bihata svabhava, which chami tvam sama samudha chetaha, which treyas janis jihadu. What? Well, is this the one with the happiness and the stress? Yeah, the person doesn't take part in sources of misery, right. knowing well that they have a beginning and an end. Beginning and an end, right, right. Right, so you can't, you know, your material happiness is going to end, your material distress is going to end. You can't even be distressful eternally. You can't be, even if you want to be distressful for this whole life, you cannot be. You will get happiness. You can't. Happiness and distress come and go. I, I'll, I'll give another example from my personal life. I have a lot of examples that help me understand Krishna consciousness. I was in, I I was in the Navy, the United States Navy, and it was during the Vietnam War, and I was against the war, and I was against this whole Navy business, and I got depressed, and I was fried, and I didn't, I just gave up doing all of my, my work. I didn't care. I said, put me in jail. I don't care. So they sent me to the doctors, see if there's anything physically wrong with me. 
And then I started thinking, I'm going to get out of the Navy. I'm going to get a, a medical discharge because I'm crazy or whatever. I was, and, then I, and then I was depressed. And then I wanted to stay depressed so I can get out. But I couldn't stay depressed because I started thinking I'm going to get out of the Navy. And then because I couldn't stay depressed, I wound up staying in the Navy. <laughs> So even though I wanted to be depressed, I couldn't be depressed. Uh, so you cannot be even depressed all the time. It's going to come and go. Sometimes people are suffering. I mean, everyone suffers, devotees. You should know it's temporary. So what do I do? I continue with my service no matter what. I don't let that stop me. You know, happiness and distress, it shouldn't interfere with your service. I'm happy, so sometimes happiness interferes. What is it? Uh, Daruka was fanning Krishna, and he became so ecstatic, it was interfering with his fanning. So he controlled his ecstasy so he could fan Krishna nicely. So these things, happiness can interfere. Generally, we think happiness, there's no problem. I could deal with it, you know. Uh, but it, that can also interfere with our... Krishna consciousness without service to Krishna. And distress certainly can influence. So we have to be steady. We have to know this is just external. It's not going to last. Whatever it is. And sometimes when you're really, really happy, then you might think, uh oh, I know it's going to end very soon. I know. And I'm a little scared of what's going to happen next <laughs> because it's going to end. And then it does. So both happiness and distress come and go. And we have, to, we have to be steady in our Krishna consciousness in spite of both the happiness and the distress. Uh, I just want to see, I, I had a few notes I have here. Oh, about knowledge. Uh, uh, Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojitaha Janayatyasu varagyam jnanam cha yat ahitukam. It said, by rendering devotional service unto the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, one immediately acquires causeless knowledge and detachment from the world. So we need this knowledge to get free from these miseries. And just by rendering service to Krishna, the knowledge comes automatically. You don't have to take so much time off to study. I mean, if you can read, you should read regularly. You should have some sort of discipline. So you're learning. You, you, Prabhupada wrote all these books, not just to distribute, but for us to read. So we have to read these books. We have to, we, but even if you can't read, even if you're illiterate, like the, the, the South, uh, the, 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 I think it was a Brahmin down south when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there and he was, has the Bhagavad Gita and he was crying and the Lord Chaitanya asked him why is he crying? He said because his guru instructed him to be, read Bhagavad Gita every day and he doesn't know how to read. So he said why are you crying? He said I'm crying because when I think of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, taking the position of a chariot driver of his devotee, it brings tears to my eyes. And Lord Chaitanya said, you are the real knower of the Bhagavad Gita. So even he couldn't read, still he's got the knowledge, he was understanding. Or well, there's a story of uh, Narada Muni, who uh, was on his way to visit Narayan and he met a Brahmin and he met a cobbler. First he met the, the, the Brahmin and they both asked him how long it will be before I go back to Godhead. So when he went back he asked Narayan and Narayan said tell the Brahmin after a hundred births he will come to me. Tell the cobbler after this one life he will come to me. So then he, and he said and they're going to ask you what I was doing. When they ask you what I was doing, tell them I was threading an elephant to the eye of a needle. So he goes and he meets the Brahmin and the Brahmin said, oh, did you see my Lord Narayan? He said, yes, I did. He said, did you ask him when I will go back to see him? He said, yes, I did. He said, and what did he say? He said, after 100 births, you will come back to see, you will come back to me. And uh, 
The Brahmin asked, what was Lord Narayan doing? He said he was threading an elephant through the eye of a needle. And he said, this is ridiculous. An elephant is so huge, a needle is so small. It's so ridiculous, you didn't see Narayan. So then he went to see, and he, he met the cobbler, and the cobbler asked the same questions. What, what, how long will it be? What was my Lord doing? And he asked how long it will be, and he said, at, at the end of this life, you will come back to me. He said, oh, it's so wonderful. He said, and what was my Lord doing? He was threading a needle, an elephant, through the eye of a needle. And he said, oh, my Lord is so wonderful. He says, you, you believe that he was threading an elephant through the eye of a needle? He said, why not? He put this huge uh, oak tree in this little acorn. Why can't he thread an elephant through the eye of a needle? So this is not blind faith. This is understanding. Krishna can do anything. If he can put this huge tree inside this little acorn, why can't he thread an elephant through the eye of a needle? So he had some realization, even though he was a simple cobbler. Another example in California, actually it was in Berkeley, uh, Prabhupada was, no, not Berkeley, it was in, uh, where's a very rich area in California? Beverly Hills. It was Beverly Hills, they were on a walk, and devotees were walking with Prabhupada, and there's beautiful houses, everything is immaculate, people are extremely wealthy in this area. It's not so much like, like in India, you have a big beautiful mansion next to a little shed, uh, a little shack. It, it's in, in America, everything is zoned, like this is the rich area, yeah, only, you can only have certain things in this area, and then you, in another area you can have other things. But anyway, so they're walking, and they see a uh, car, beautiful car, I don't remember what car, what, someday we will have a car like this for Krishna and the devotees, Jai Srila Prabhupada. And then someday we will have a house like this for Krishna and devotees, Jai Srila Prabhupada. And, and then there's the gardens, beautiful gardens. Someday we will have gardens like this for Krishna. Jai Srila Prabhupada. And then they go and there's this you know, big mansion where they have these fences, gates, that are that open up automatically when you're driving in and then close you know you know for the owners have a button to press so there's these gates there and and then they're walking by and these two big dogs run and start barking at the devotees and Srila Prabhupada says someday we will have dogs like this for Krishna and the devotee said Jai Srila Prabhupada and then Srila Prabhupada said what are we going to do with dogs <laughs> So this is an example of how we shouldn't just have blind faith. You know, anything he says, yeah, Jai Shilpa, it should make sense to us. If it doesn't make sense, we should question. You know, of course, question submissively, but we should question. We shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't just accept anything if it doesn't make sense. So this Krishna consciousness, why I accepted Krishna consciousness, because in that year I checked out every single different religion I can, came across and I found something wrong with every one of them. And when I found something wrong, I questioned it. And if I didn't get a good answer, I rejected that religion. And in Krishna consciousness, I found a lot of things I didn't think were right, but when I questioned them, I got really good, satisfactory answers. So, and, uh, and I, anyway, so that's basically I had to if I was honest with myself, I had to become a devotee in spite of how I really didn't want to do it. But I'm glad I did. <laughs> so we have a, a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs>